All right, so this video is going to be covering chapter 13, section 1, which deals with compounds in aqueous solutions. And the first thing we're going to talk about is something called dissociation. And dissociation is a process that ionic compounds undergo when they are dissolved in water. Basically, ionic compounds will separate into their cation and their anion. For example, if we take calcium chloride, which is a solid crystal, and add and dip it into water, dissolve it into water so that it's in solution, you end up with a calcium 2 plus ion, and again we use AQ as the symbol for aqueous solution, plus two negative chlorine ions, which again are aqueous. Both of these are aqueous because they are dissolved into a water solution. And you'll notice that during this process of dissociation, one formula unit of calcium chloride, which contains three ions, will break up into one ion of calcium and two ions of chlorine. So the number of ions on each side remains balanced. Likewise, because you can multiply this by Avogadro's number or any number really, uh, the number of moles of each ion remain constant. So if you have one mole of calcium chloride, you will end up with one mole of calcium, because there's basically one mole of calcium inside this ionic compound over here, plus two moles of chlorine ions because there's two chlorines for every one mole of calcium chloride. And this goes back just basically to the law of conservation of mass. You have to keep the same number of chlorines on each side as you do as calciums on each side, etc. You can't just destroy ions because they dissociate in solution. So now we're going to be looking at precipitation reactions which have a lot to do with whether or not something is soluble, usually in water, which is the solvent we use most common, or if it is insoluble. And to determine that, we often use a chart like what I have over here, or the one that's on page 437 of your book down at the bottom. For example, if we wanted to determine the solubility of, let's say, sodium carbonate and uh, see whether or not it would dissociate in water, we would have to look over at a chart like this. So it says right here in rule number one that all sodium, potassium, and ammonium salts are soluble. So we're good, this has sodium in it, and because it is soluble, this means that we are allowed to write a dissociation reaction for it. So you start off with your sodium carbonate, which dissociates into two sodium ions, in an aqueous solution, again because there's two sodiums over here, plus a carbonate ion, which once again is in an aqueous solution. If for example we were trying to see what would happen with calcium phosphate, we would again reference the chart and see whether or not calcium phosphate is soluble. So it says over here on the chart that all phosphate, chromate, and oxide salts are not soluble. And because in the exceptions it only has sodium, potassium, or ammonium, and not calcium, we can determine that this is then insoluble. And you cannot write a dissociation for an insoluble compound. So now getting into more detail about precipitates. Uh, if you mix two solutions, occasionally what you will find is that as you are pouring in one solution from, let's say, another beaker, like this, is that some sort of compound will start forming where you're pouring it in. And usually this is some sort of cloudy, uh, solid substance that forms inside this solution, and this part is what is known as a precipitate. 
So now, in order to predict whether or not a precipitate will form, we have to know the solubility of the products of a chemical reaction. For example, if we were to mix ammonium sulfide in an aqueous solution so that it dissociated into ammonium and sulfur ions and cadmium nitrate, once again, this would dissociate because it's an ionic compound into its respective cadmium and nitrate ions. We would have to then know the solubility of the products. In this case, those products would be uh, ammonium nitrate and cadmium sulfide. But right now, we don't know whether or not they will be aqueous, solid, or gaseous. So right now, we just have question marks for their states in the products. All right, now that we've cleaned up this reaction a little bit, we can look at the solubility of the products. That is the things over here to determine whether or not we'll get a cloudy substance, an indication that precipitation has occurred. So first of all, we'll look at ammonium nitrate. And rule number one says ammonium salts are soluble. So we know for a fact this is going to be soluble in water and therefore aqueous. Next, we have to look at cadmium sulfide. Rule number two, down here under the non-soluble ionic compounds, says that all sulfide salts are not soluble. And we'll notice that cadmium is not one of the three exceptions listed here. So we know that this will not form an aqueous solution and therefore will instead remain solid, that is not dissolved in water due to the attractive forces between the cadmium sulfide. We can therefore determine that a precipitation reaction like the one illustrated up here will occur wherein the cloudy solid will be cadmium sulfide. Now we're going to be discussing net ionic equations which are essentially the double replacement reactions we talked about earlier but with a clearer view of the dissociation and what actually reacts. So if we were to more accurately display how this upper reaction occurs in solution, we would take all these ions because these compounds all dissociate into their constituent ions in solution. All these ions are aqueous and then the cadmium and the sulfur would react to form the solid and you would be left with your ammonium ions NH4 plus and your nitrate ions. Now you'll notice you end up with the same formula for ammonium and nitrate on either side and this is because these really don't take part in the reaction. These are what are known as spectator ions. That is, they are in the solution, however, they don't take part in forming the precipitate or actually reacting. Rather, they remain dissolved as part of the aqueous solution the whole time while the cadmium and sulfur do the actual reaction. Now, because you have these spectator ions on either side not really doing anything uh, in this ionic equation, what you can do is sort of cancel them out and what you're left with is the simple reaction of sulfur and cadmium both are in an aqueous solution precipitating to form solid cadmium sulfide and this equation down here the simplified version that does not have the spectator ions in it is what is known as the net ionic equation and this not only describes the reaction between ammonium sulfide and cadmium nitrate, but really any aqueous solutions that involve sulfur ions and cadmium ions to form a cadmium solid, a cadmium precipitate, can be described by this net ionic equation. Moving on now, we're going to be discussing ionization, which is a process through which ions are formed from a covalent solute. Now this is a very important part of the definition over here. If you'll remember in disassociation 
you take a ionic compound, like let's say NaCl, which already has a positive and a negative ion, and the attraction to the polar, let's say, water molecule uh, will break up these ions or the ionic compound into their constituent ions. Now these ions become hydrated, that is, they're completely surrounded by water molecules with, you know, their, in this case, negative poles pointed towards the positive sodium, or in chlorine's case, it would be vice versa. However, in disassociation, you started off with an ionic compound that initially had two ions. You have one Na ion and one Cl ion. In ionization, what happens is you take a, an essentially neutral compound, like let's say hydrogen chloride, which has covalent bonds, that is, they're sharing electrons, so there is no positive and negative. I mean, this is slightly polar, so because this chlorine is more electronegative, it will tend to have the electrons more often, making this and slightly more positive more often. However, you don't have any ions within this compound. You start off with zero ions, and then when you dissolve the HCl into a water solution, you end up with two ions. So you go from zero to, in this case, two. And the reason you are able to create these two ions within the solution is due to the polar nature of both the hydrogen chloride as well as water. Because water molecules are very polar, they will tend to have a very negative end over here by the oxygen, which attracts the positive hydrogen, or vice versa, if you have a water molecule over here with its positive hydrogen ends pointing towards the more negative chlorine ends, uh, this tension between the positive end being attracted by oxygens and the negative end being attracted by hydrogens will be enough to overcome this bond and you will end up with a hydrogen which is essentially a proton, so a hydrogen positive ion and a chlorine negative ion, both surrounded by, you know, water molecules with their respective attracted ends pointed towards the ions. Now after the hydrogen chloride has dissociated into its respective hydrogen and chlorine ions, what you'll notice is that hydrogen, which is simply one proton and one electron, will have lost its only electron. So floating around it becomes a positive, almost point-like object because there's very little uh, shielding from electrons to balance out this attraction. So this lone hydrogen atom, or proton I guess, will be very attractive. In fact, so attractive that it will rarely exist in nature by itself. What will tend to happen is that it will pass by a water molecule with its positive and negative ends, and it will tend to find its way to latch on to the negative end of the water molecule. So now instead of having, you know, neutral H2O, you have added one hydrogen, and this hydrogen carries a positive charge. So you end up with a molecule that has the formula H3O plus, and this is known as hydronium. So taking into account the formation of these hydronium ions, the real uh, formula for ionization of HCl in water would be HCl dissolved in water forms hydronium, which is dissolved in water, so it's aqueous, and a chlorine ion, which is also aqueous. Now we're going to very briefly touch on the differences between strong and weak electrolytes. Now some examples of strong electrolytes would be sodium chloride, uh, hydrogen chloride, hydrogen bromide, and hydrogen iodide. And this is because all of these will form, you know, high concentrations
of ions within a solution. And the reason this makes them strong electrolytes, that is, able to carry a current very well, is because all of these constituent ions that they will form have a charge, and current is just carrying charge in a certain direction. And all of these are able to carry a current so well because they dissolve almost all of their ions completely. That is, if you take salt, add it to water, you're going to end up with almost 100% uh, sodium ions plus chlorine ions. You're not going to get many salt crystals floating around until you reach the point of saturation. There are some ionic compounds, however, that are what are known as weak electrolytes. That is, they don't conduct a current very well at all. One, for example, is hydrogen fluoride, which, while it is very ionic, uh, with the positive and negative ends at the hydrogen and fluorine, respectively, the problem is that if you take aqueous fluorine and add it to liquid water, what ends up happening is that the bond between the hydrogen and the fluorine is so strong that oftentimes when you get a proton from an ionized hydrogen floating around, it will find its way back to a negative fluorine and reform this bond. So there isn't a very high concentration of, you know, independent hydrogen and independent fluorine molecules within this solution because they reform this stable uh, neutral molecule too fast.